Let's hold our Bibles in our hands and make this confession together. I thank you, Father, that your word has the power to change my life. Today, I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word, and I'll never be the same. After today, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Oh, one of the churches is a little wonky here. They're about to lose their lampstand. I taught on that last week. One of the churches needs to mind their P's and Q's. Just sort of a review here uh, about the... Uh, about the whole tabernacle series. I'm standing here in the outer court. Actually, all of us are in the outer court. The outer court was 75 feet wide by 150 feet long. The, there was one gate at the east where you came into the tabernacle courtyard. There was an altar, uh, a brazen altar where sacrifices were made. Then there was a laver here where the priests would wash their hands and their feet and they would wash before they offered sacrifices or before they entered into the holy place. Now if you're new to this, this is our one, two, three, four, fifth, fifth message on in this series. And uh, all of these are online, or you can go to the bookstore and get the audio CDs if you want those, or you can go online and actually watch these, uh, the past messages that we've done. So I'm not going to go into a, a big history on the tabernacle. We did that the very first message that we did. Uh, offering the sacrifice first, the labor represents purity and being cleansed. And then there was a curtain here that separated what was called the holy place. The holy place was 15 feet wide, 15 feet tall, and 30 feet long. And inside the holy place, there are three elements or three items. And that is the, this church really needs help here. The, uh, the, uh, there is the lamp stand, the golden lamp stand that we taught on last week that represents the Holy Spirit. Then today we're going to talk about the table of the bread of the presence of God, which represents the Word of God. And then next Sunday we're going to talk about the altar of incense. And then the last Sunday of the series we'll be talking about the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. The, uh, the, all of this matters. This is Old Testament stuff. Most of the scriptures that we're talking about are in the Old Testament. But all of this matters greatly to us. And the reason that it matters is because the tabernacle is a model of the tabernacle in heaven. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 through 6, we're going to look at in a few moments, actually talks about the tabernacle in heaven and Jesus Christ being our high priest, Aaron was the high priest of the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness. And Jesus Christ is the high priest of the tabernacle in heaven. This represents, and the main thing that we learn from the tabernacle, this whole tabernacle series, is the presence of God among his people. That God doesn't just want to be a distant God, a God, somebody that's up in heaven, somebody that we can kind of contact we can we can pray prayers shoot prayers toward heaven and so and hope something sticks or that there's somebody up there that's going to hear but god wanted his habitation with his people even out in the desert in the middle of the hot desert god wanted his presence manifested with his people and he had moses build a tabernacle just so so many intricate details to the tabernacle because it was a model of the tabernacle that was in heaven and so as you entered into the tabernacle courtyard first of all an offering was made for uh your sin, which we have already covered, represents the cross or the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. Then the laver represents purity and the, um, the purity that the cross gives to us. Then after that, you enter into the holy place here, the priests did, and the priests would, morning and evening, they would, the priests would come in here twice a, year, uh, twice a day, morning and evening. They would fill up the lamp with oil so that the and trim the wicks so that this lamp never went out. And they would also minister here. The, this is for the drink offerings. Then the table of showbread we're going to talk about in a minute. And then they would also take a coal from the brazen altar and 
and take, bring coals in here, put them on the altar of incense and burn incense here, which we're going to discover next week what all that represents and what that is all about. Today we're talking about the bread of the presence of God. And if you found Exodus chapter 25 yet, everybody got that? Exodus chapter 25, this is called the bread, uh, the King James Version calls it show bread. A better translation would be the bread of the presence of God, or actually this word presence of God. Let's read it first, and then let me uh, share some things with you. Exodus chapter 25, verse 23. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And this table right here is built to these exact specifications. This is the size that the table was. Sharon Schaefer, thank you for building this. I don't know what a cubit is, but she, she built that. You shall make, it, make for it a frame of a hand breadth all around, and you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And it has that detail even. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And we have that. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring, and you shall make them of pure gold, and you shall set it, and you shall set the showbread on the table before me also. So now this, this word, this term showbread could also, could actually better be translated bread of his presence. This term showbread also contains the Hebrew, uh, some Hebrew that actually uh, refers to the face of God. Some translations, some of your Hebrew translations actually refer to this as the bread of the face of God or the table of the face of God. Now, before we talk about this, I mean, it, it seems a little bit, a bit odd that God would have a tabernacle built like this and then he would have them bring bread in here. And this bread, what this bread represents, and why even have bread in here? I want to talk with you, before we talk about this table in particular, I want to talk with you about the importance of covenant meal. A covenant meal. In the Old Testament, there were, and we're going to see in a moment in, in the New Testament, there is this, this, this thing about whenever covenants are made, there's a meal involved. And I'm going to show you several references to that. But first of all, I find it interesting that at Passover, the Israelites have been in bondage to the Egyptians for 430 years. And God comes along and he says, I'm going to deliver you. And so uh, God sends plagues upon the Egyptians, let my people go. They will not let the Israelites go. And so finally God says there's going to be one more plague. And the firstborn from the people to the animals, the firstborn of everything in the land of Egypt is going to die. But I'm going to make a covenant with you. Everybody say covenant. I'm going to make a covenant. I want you to remember this word covenant because that's what this is all about. I'm going to make a covenant with you. If you will put the blood of the lamb, how many of you know I could preach on this forever? If you can put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, then, then I will pass over your house. That's why it's called Passover. And everybody in your house will be safe. Got it? So then, after God makes that covenant with Israel, he says to them, let's have a meal together. The menu is roast lamb and unleavened bread, and we're going to have a meal. Which I'm sure some Israelites may be thought to themselves, um, the most devastating event in Egypt's history is getting ready to occur t tonight, and you want to have a meal? But this represented God's covenant with Israel. I'm making a covenant with you. Here's the deal. You put the blood on, on the doorposts. I'm going to pass over your house. Everybody's going to be safe. That's the covenant I'm making with you. And now we're going to seal it with a meal. Roast lamb and unleavened bread. Genesis chapter 26. In Genesis chapter 26, I want to briefly 
uh, set the stage for this whole idea of a covenant meal. Genesis chapter 26, verse 28. But Abimelech said, We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you, Abraham. So we said, Let there now be an oath or a covenant between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, since we have not touched you, and since we have done nothing to you but good, and have sent you away in peace, you are now the blessed of the Lord. So then... Abraham made them a feast, and they ate and drank. And then they arose early in the morning, swore an oath with one another, and Isaac, it's not Abraham, it's Isaac, I apologize. Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. So we see here that a covenant was made between Abimelech and Isaac, and then uh, Isaac said, well, let's have a meal together. Then in uh, Exodus chapter 24, this one, this is really fascinating. This is, this is one of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible. You need to turn to this. Exodus chapter 24, verse 9. This is Moses and the 70 elders going up on the mountain, Mount Sinai. And Moses is getting ready to get instructions from God about the covenant. And in uh, Exodus chapter 24, verse 9, Then Moses went up. Also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as if it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Can you imagine that? Moses and the 70 Elders of Israel on Mount Sinai eating and drinking with God. I find this fascinating. And then, and then it says in verse 12, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So you see, right before God is getting ready to make a covenant with Moses and then uh, ultimately the children of Israel, first of all, they have a meal together. Is anybody seeing a pattern here? So then, if you go with me to um, Leviticus chapter 24... Still in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 24, God gives instructions about what's supposed to happen on this table. He told them how to build the table, what was going to happen with the table, but, uh, or how to build the table. Now he's going to tell them what goes on it. Exodus chapter 24, verse 5. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. And you shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant." So every seven days they put out new bread on the table. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons. I know everybody wonders, so what happens? Does God actually come down from heaven and eat this bread? It says that this bread is actually for Aaron and his sons. And they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. So what we see here is that the priests are having a covenant meal with God because this whole tabernacle represents the covenant of God and God living with his people. He wanted a habitation with his people. And so this bread represents the presence of God with the people and it represents the covenant that God's made with his people. And so then the priests actually eat this as a covenant meal. Anybody seeing this? Eating this as a covenant meal with God in a holy place. Now, the, uh, the Bible says that these 12 loaves represent the 12 tribes of Israel. But they don't just represent the tribes themselves. What these, this bread represents is the covenant that God made with the 12 tribes of Israel. Now today, we have a covenant with God, and that covenant is in your lap, or on your phone, or on your iPad, or on your Android, or on your, yep, 
on your computer. It is the word of God. This word is God's covenant with us. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, it says, now this is the main point we have, point of the things that we are saying. We have, this is New Testament now, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So here, what I'm what this says again, we looked at this the first time we started this, is that there is a tabernacle in heaven and Jesus Christ is the high priest of that tabernacle in heaven. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, Jesus Christ, also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests already who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of heavenly things. The priests on earth serve the copy and the shadow of the tabernacle and the lampstand and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. They serve the one on earth that's a shadow of the one that's in heaven. Verse 6, but now Jesus Christ has obtained a more excellent ministry in, in as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant than the covenant that was mediated at the tabernacle and was established on better promises. Everybody say, thank God for my Bible. Because your Bible outlines a better covenant that's based on better promises than this. And there's so much symbolism in the tabernacle, but I really, I really, uh, I'm really fascinated by people who are more fascinated by the tabernacle itself than fascinated by their own Bible. We have that in the body of Christ. I, I hesitated to build this because I didn't want anybody to think that we had gone completely off the deep end when it came to all things Jewish because Jesus Christ has mediated a better covenant based on better promises than what this is this is symbolic of what is to come but now thank God for the Bible Thank God for the word because now as wonderful as this is, as fascinating as this is, and there's nobody that's enjoying this series more than I am. I love it. But at the same time, we got to realize that all of this was superseded by a better covenant made from better promises. The word of God, the Bible that you hold in your lap. So now... John chapter 1, I want you to go here because it's important that we see this. John chapter 1, verse 1. Jesus says, or the Bible says, John says, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, the Word, was in the beginning with God. John chapter 1, verse 2, verse 3. And all things were made through him, the word, and without him, the word, nothing was made that was made. In him, the word was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Or actually, what that literally means is the darkness could not put out the light. Now, if you look at verse 14, it says, and the word that was, we've been talking about in verses 1 through 4, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Wonder who that could be. Anybody have a clue? That could be Jesus. And the word in the beginning, so we could go back and say in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. He, Jesus was in the beginning with God and all things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. In Jesus was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot extinguish it. And the word Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, verse 14, and we beheld Jesus' glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's important to see that Jesus is the word. Jesus is his word. Why is that important? Go with me over to John chapter 6. Am I going too fast? Everybody good? John chapter 6. We're going to talk about the table in just a moment. John chapter 6. 
Verse 48. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. I, I love the way Jesus does this about the new covenant. You know, wouldn't it be really cool for you to walk out on your front lawn and it be covered with manna? Jesus said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Jesus is saying there's a better bread with you than the manna that's in, that was in the wilderness. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So Jesus is saying that he is the living bread. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the what? Word. word. And the word was with God and the word was God and the word was who? Jesus. So Jesus is his word and the word is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, I am the bread. I'm the bread of life. If you go over to John chapter 6 verse 63, Jesus continues talking about the bread. I don't have time to read all of this. This is really good reading from uh, all the way from verse 48 through 63. But let's go skip over to 63. Jesus says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you. The words that I speak to you. The words that I speak to you. Everybody hold up your Bible. PDA, P, uh, your phone, whatever you got. Hold up your Bible. The words that I speak to you. They are Spirit and they are life. Jesus said, I am the bread of Life. He says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. life. So the bread on the table of the bread of the presence of God represents the bread of life. So now the covenant meal that we now eat with God, the priest came in and they would eat a covenant meal with God. With the bread here. And the Bible describes certain drink offerings that were on this table that we don't have time to go into today. But the priests ate a covenant meal. Now today, we eat a covenant meal with God. Anybody guess what that is? Communion. The Lord's Supper, again, is a covenant meal that we eat with God. And next Sunday, we're actually going to be having communion together. But I wanted to teach on it today so you, would get a, you could get a mindset about communion uh, and what it actually is. Next Sunday, we're going to be having communion. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, talks about uh, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23, Jesus says this, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord, or this is Paul talking, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he said, take this and eat it. This is my body which is broken for you in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. Everybody say covenant. This cup is the new covenant. In my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now I understand that it's Passover, but you do realize that this is the, the night of Passover is the most excruciating night of Jesus' life. Because the next day he's going to be crucified, which is a horrible way to die. And he already knows it. Nobody else can see it. The priests are planning it. The disciples don't have a clue, but Jesus knows. And Jesus is getting ready to die on the cross and seal the covenant for us. He's getting ready to, to go to the altar and make the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He knows that's getting ready to happen. And so Jesus says, hey, let's do this. Let's go to the upper room and what? Have a meal together. Really, Jesus? 
You're going to have a meal. Well, we know it's Passover, but you could be excused considering what you're going to have to deal with tomorrow. Don't you want to get spiritually prepared? I am getting spiritually prepared. I'm having the Passover meal with you because I'm getting ready to seal the covenant tomorrow. This, this meal, this table is important stuff. This word, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Thank God that we don't have to die in our sins, but that we can be resurrected with him. Amen? Amen. Come on, church. Who's excited about that? We can be resurrected with Christ. But Jesus died on the cross, not, and that's just a piece of it. Jesus died on the cross to seal the covenant of the word of God that he made with us. He had a meal first, went to the cross, died, sealed the covenant. Then he resurrected. I love this. He resurrected. And the disciples then are out. Peter says uh, they're, they're in the upper room. Jesus is dead. They're in the upper room. And Peter says, you know what, guys? I'm just so discouraged. I'm going fishing. Which is what, that, and there's a whole teaching in that. That's what Peter used to do. He used to be a fisherman. And so Jesus, Peter says, I'm going fishing. So they go out fishing and they're out on a boat. And they're coming into land. And there's a guy standing on the shore cooking fish. And John turns to Peter and he says, it's the Lord. Jesus calls out to him. He says, children, have you caught anything? And when John hears that voice, John turns to Peter and says, it's the Lord. And the Bible says that Peter then jumps out of the boat and heads for shore. And what's Jesus doing? He's cooking a meal for them. What is this eating? They must, they must all be Pentecostals is all I can think. Because every time you turn, they're always eating. I have sealed the covenant, guys. Not only have I died on the cross, but now I've raised from the dead. I've sealed the covenant. Hey, let's have a meal. Let's eat. I'm cooking fish for you. I want to I just here for a few moments talk about the importance of this lampstand. This one church here is really having an issue here. Man, I got to... We need to pray for this church. We need to, it's the one, two, three, four, fifth church, whichever this fifth church is in the book of Revelation, is, they're going to need some prayer. I know most people wish I wouldn't even pay attention to that, but I w I've been blessed with OCD. So, you know, I, I'm trying to talk and weren't, then that just messes me. All right. So anyway, the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk with you just a moment about the power of the Holy Spirit, this lampstand as it relates to this table of showbread. When you walk into the holy place here, when you walk into the curtain, maybe the first thing you notice is the lampstand because this whole room is lit up by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this is on the, uh, the table of showbread. The Bible is clear that the table of showbread is on the north side of the holy place. And the lampstand is on the south side of the holy place. And we actually are scripturally correct here. This is the north and south side. And the lampstand then is illuminating this whole room. And the lampstand, the Holy Spirit, is illuminating the table of showbread, which represents the word of God. And so... What we need to see is that it's important that the Holy Spirit, our teacher, illuminates the Word of God for us. There have been so many cults, so many weird people, so many weird beliefs, so many strange things done in the name of what people think they find in the Bible because it hasn't been illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can make this Bible say anything. The Bible says Judas went out into a garden and hanged himself. The Bible also says, go ye therefore and do likewise. The Bible also says, that which thou doest, doest quickly. <laughs> so you can use the Bible to justify going out and killing yourself. Or any myriad of other things. The Bible must be illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Um, in John chapter 14, verse 26, it says that the Holy Spirit is our teacher and he illuminates the word of God. I want to show you in just a moment why it's important that this lampstand illuminate the word of God here, this 
table of the presence of God, the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 talks about, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the armor of God. In fact, at our men's breakfast at Golden Corral on the first Saturday of each month, we've been talking about, the, we've been going through the armor of God. And when it gets to the sword of the Spirit, verse 17, it says, when it, it describes the different parts of armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. And then when it talks about the sword, it calls the sword, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Now, actually the word of can be used just to show possession. This is the Bible of Steve Corona. But that phrase actually means more than that. The Amplified Bible says, the sword that the Spirit wields. The sword of the Spirit is actually the sword in the hands of the Spirit. The Word of God in the hands of the Spirit. And in this, uh, in this passage here, Ephesians 6, 17, it says the sword that the Bible, the Word of God, when it says the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God the word for word, W-O-R-D, that word, word, actually is the Greek word rhema. There are two different Greek words in the Bible, actually three that mean word, but the two that are li listed in the Bible are the words logos and the words rhema. And the, literally the word logos means the written word of God, the word of God that you have in your hand, the pen and ink or the, what you have on your phone or on your uh, uh, pad, that word, those words that are printed there are the logos. They are the printed word of God. Then there's the Greek word rhema. Now, the word rhema is actually the word that is written to us, that is illuminated by the Holy Spirit. That is rhema, if it's illuminated by the Holy Spirit. I can read, I can read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible, and it's logos, but then when a passage of Scripture is illuminated by the Holy Spirit, has anybody ever experienced that? Anybody here ever read the Bible? And you've, you read a Scripture you've read 50 times. 60 times, but all of a sudden you read it and you go, I didn't know that was in there. And you, but you've read it. It has all of a sudden become rhema, rhema to you. And this is the word of God in the hands of the Spirit. Now, sometimes people get a little mixed up and they think, well, that means that the rhema is important and the logos is not. So if it's a Bible scripture, unless God speaks to you, you don't have to do it. And that's not, that's not right either. All of this is the Word of God. It's all the Word of God. The written Word of God is the Logos. It's so powerful. The Logos, this shows us what God's will is for us. Every scripture, this is all God's will for you. It's not like, well, unless the Holy Spirit speaks to me about that scripture, that's not God's will for me. This is all God's will for you. But then when the Holy Spirit illuminates it and it comes alive, then you can step out and stand out on that scripture knowing that that word from God will hold you up in any circumstance. A perfect example of this, uh, of this Logos versus Rhema is Matthew chapter 14. When Peter walked on the water. The disciples are out in a boat and a storm comes up and they see a figure coming out on the water. Matthew chapter 14 and the, uh, the disciples think it's a ghost. And then when they recognize it's the Lord, Peter says, Peter's, Peter's an interesting guy. <laughs> Peter says to Jesus, Lord, if this is you, bid me to come out, command me to come out on the water. Notice Peter didn't just jump out in the water on his own. He waited for that word, that rhema word. When Jesus spoke to Peter and said, come, that's when Peter knew he could walk out on the water. So Peter gets right out of the boat and walks right out on the water. Peter did not walk out on the water because he had read the Old Testament and he knew that the, disciples, that the uh, Israelites had parted the Red Sea. When they stepped into the Red Sea, the Bible says that when they stepped into the Red Sea, the Red Sea parted. See, what, what you see on TV is when they stand there and they wait for the sea to part and then they walk in. But the Bible says that when they stepped in, 
Everybody put your foot down. When they stepped in, they stepped in, and the moment they took that step of faith on the word of God, the waters parted. So Peter did not read that and go, well, the Israelites did it. So if I jump out of this boat into the sea, the whole sea is going to part. Anybody learn anything here? So he waited for that rhema word from Jesus, and when Jesus said, Peter, come. Then Peter knew he had a word from Jesus and he stepped out of the boat and he walked on the water. Now I've heard people ridicule the other 11 disciples and say, well, Peter was the only one that had the faith to get out of the boat. Hold on. Peter was the only one Jesus said to him, come. If the rest of them had stepped out of the boat, they would have all drowned. Because Jesus didn't give, that, give them that word. And I see people stepping out on the water on a word that God has given to somebody else, thinking it's going to work for them. And they step out on the water and they drown. How come God, God hates me? How come the word of God doesn't work? Oh, it'll work. It's that they had a rhema. They prayed, sought God, heard from the Holy Spirit, and they stepped out on a rhema. And you're stepping out on, what so, you're stepping out on somebody else's rhema. Hmm. And you know what? And here's another thing. I see this happen a lot. Peter didn't take the show on the road. Peter is not going from town to town to town to town saying, watch this. Look what I can do. One time, Jesus told him, step out on the water, and he did. That was a rhema word to him. There is actual, this is a, this is a documented fact. That in um, in Africa, um, there was they there was a big meeting, a big prayer meeting, a big they had a big rally, and they were talking about Peter walking on the water. And there were three teenagers that came to a raging river, and the bridge was washed out. But they prayed and believed God that because Peter could do it, they could do it, and they stepped right out on the water, and all three of them drowned. So the word of God is not true? No. Peter had a rhema. They didn't have a rhema. They didn't have a word from God that they could do that. And I, I, you know, I hope you're taking this to heart. I love to see people walk out, step out in faith. But you've got to step out in faith on the rhema of God. And not what somebody else is doing, what you've heard that, that somebody else has done. Um, we must read... now. Again, the, the, the danger in, this is, this is important stuff that we have to talk about, but the danger in talking about this with you is for people to leave here and think that this Bible is not important, that the words written on here are not important unless you hear a voice. And that is not true. Everything in this Bible belongs to you. And every command that belongs in this Bible is your command. Every correction, come on somebody, Every correction that's in this Bible is your command. Amen. All the do's are yours and the don'ts are yours. And the attitude adjustments and the forgiveness, it's all ours. And so we don't just, we don't just read, let's see if I can get a rhema on this. Uh, Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not getting it. I'm not, not happening. Now, come on, I'm not getting it. This, that's just on the paper. I'm not getting it. No. What you do is you pray and you pray over the word and you speak the word and you believe God until that becomes rhema to you. It's all God's word and it's all for you. And so you need to pray until it becomes rhema to you. And so, listen, there have been plenty of times. Uh, I mean, I'm dealing with stuff in my own life right now. There are plenty of times when we deal with things that we know what God's will is. We know what God's will is. But... You, you ever know what God's will is, but you just don't feel it? Come on, somebody. You know what God's will is. It just, it's just not really, just, you just, you're just not excited about it. Just me. There are times, I, you know, I know it's God's will, but I'm just not, it just, it just doesn't have a hard hold of my heart yet. So I don't just dismiss it and say, well, it must not be. If it was really God's will, then I'd have a rhema word. But I pray I pray the word and I speak it. I mean, there, there are times when, because the Bible says healing is yours. And you can, uh, you, go, you can get a really, really bad report that says, well, you're going to die. Yeah, but the Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. I know what it's like to get up and not feel healed. 
I know what it's like to get up and feel worse. I know what it's like to go to the doctor and get a worse doctor's report than when I started trying to believe. I'm believing this stuff, speaking this stuff, trying to stand in this stuff. And you go to the doctor and he says, oh, you're much, you're much worse. You're much worse. So what are you going to do? Well, I wish I had a rainbow word from God, but I really don't. But this is all yours. All the promises of God, the Bible says, are yes and amen. They're all yours. So what you do is you keep saying it. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. If you got to vomit between every word, I'm serious. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. The devil will not rob me of this healing. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Guess what? You may have to say that for two weeks, two months, or two years. But one day you're going to wake up and that word, that Logos word that you've been speaking and standing on is going to become rhema to you. And you're going to get up and you're going to go, oh my goodness. Wow. I actually believe that. I've actually got it on the inside of me. And then nobody can steal that healing from you. It needs to become rhema. So we got to get into the word. Thank God for the table. Thank God for the bread of the word of God that belongs to us. Amen. Learn anything out of this word today? Yes. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about, next Sunday, we're going to take these two elements with us. And I, forgive me for calling the Word of God and the Holy Spirit elements, but I think you understand what I mean. We're going to take the Holy Spirit and we're going to take the Word of God in with us and we're going to go to the altar of incense and we're going to talk about prayer and how prayer moves us into the presence of God. It's going to be great. Everybody stand with me, please. Everybody say, thank God for the Word. The Word of God is my sustenance. The Word of God is my bread. The Word of God puts me over. The rhema Word of God is what I seek when I pray over the Bible. Speak to us, God, as we seek you with our whole hearts. And we move forward in your plan. For our lives, for our families, for our businesses, for our church. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, please, just a moment. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a decision to follow Christ. What we've talked about today and the reality of the Word of God, the rhema Word of God, is for those who are believers, those who are walking with God, those who are walking in the presence of God and the power of God. God loves you, God has a plan for your life, and His plan is that the Word of God would live big on the inside of you. Because of sin, every person in this room was separated from God. But Jesus Christ came and paid the price for your sin with His death on the cross so that you can be free to serve Him, free to fulfill your destiny in God, and free to spend eternity with Him. So what you need to do today is turn from your sin, turn from your old life, and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord today. Maybe you've been to church all your life. Maybe you've been in this church a long time. Maybe you've never been to church before. Maybe you used to serve God, but you've fallen away from the Lord. Or maybe this is your first time at church. First time hearing a message like this. But the Holy Spirit is drawing you into the kingdom of God. I want to lead you in a prayer right there where you're standing, repenting for your sins, acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and asking the Holy Spirit to come in and empower you to be the Christian that the Bible promises you that you can be. You can do that right there where you're standing. So while every head's bowed, every eye's closed, this is between you and God. This is between them and God. This is, this is not for us. This is between them and God. Everybody that wants to pray this prayer with me and everybody that wants to make a decision to follow Christ, I want you to raise your hand real high. And I'm going to pray a prayer with you right there where you are. Raise your hand now. Thank you, Jesus. We just thank you, God, for being here. Holy Spirit, being here and drawing men and women into the kingdom of God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any hands. So I want everyone to say this after me. Father, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is here to draw men and women into the kingdom of God. As we bring our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, and our relatives to church with us, we thank you that you're here, Holy Spirit, to give them the same life that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Who got anything out of this message today? Was that a blessing to you? Good. Good. Amen.